Ask him a lawyer. His own worst enemy. The jury are going to ask themselves, would I buy real estate from that man? I wouldn't buy a bag of peanuts from that man. But everybody's entitled to a good defense. Um, we got a telegram today. We did? Well, you did. You have been nominated by the Community Fund Committee as a candidate for the Man of the Year Award. <laughs> they must be having trouble. Oh, well, I think that you deserve it. Not as much as Earl Ryder. You've made this newspaper what it is. But I must add, that decision is becoming increasingly difficult with each passing year. And so tonight, I feel uniquely privileged to be announcing this year's Man of the Year. Ladies and gentlemen of Santa Barbara, our very own Mr. Owen Marshall. Uh -huh. Must be quite a night for you. That award should be on your mantle, Earl, not mine. Oh, come on, Counselor. I can't stand a good winner. Hardly outshines a good loser, darling. Sylvia, have I told you how beautiful you look tonight? But not radiant. I said to Earl, when you win, I'm going to be radiant. Sylvia, we should let these hard-working people get to bed. I forget our sun has cast a very long shadow. We're victims. Earl and I are victims. That is the cue to leave. Oh, and good night and thanks. Good night. Good night, Sylvia. Good night, Earl. Not again. Come on down. I hate to seem ungracious, Admiral, but she's right. Earl should have that award. Now, uh, listen to me, Owen. Not only is the man's son a deserter from the army, but Earl Ryder openly sympathizes with him. Just read his column. Well, isn't sympathy more a virtue than a crime? All right, he did have support on the committee. He was a fine reporter. He almost lost his life in Korea. There's no question but what he was a fine American. Excuse me, Admiral Chaston. Of course, Melissa, any time. What is it? Do you have to almost die to be a fine American? It's hardly worth renting the tux. Oh, well, we haven't been out for a while. Well, nobody's called lately, hadn't you noticed? Maybe we're to blame. We should do more entertaining. We're not to blame. We didn't desert. We also didn't spend eight months in the Vietnam jungles. Oh, the loyal, loving father. Keith can do no wrong. Must everything be labeled right or wrong? Earl, plenty of room over here. Thanks, I've already had my taco burger. Actually, it's your client here that I've been trying to catch up with. There are one or two points on your side, Mr. Stedman, but I'd like to clarify. Well, it's about time. I mean, your coverage of my case has been a long way from heartwarming, hasn't it? Oh, I think he's been very fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it's just the right of touch that prejudices me. Stedman, I'm just a newspaper man trying to do his job. Now, don't bleed over my lunch, fellow. I know who you are. If you're such a hotshot reporter, then you know I had two boys in Vietnam who didn't bug out. Skip it, Stedman. This isn't going anywhere. On the contrary, I'm getting something off my chest. For the record, newspaper boy, I do not like plunking down my money to read your bleeding heart slop about our country. And about my two boys. They didn't want to be overseas, but they went and they stayed. <laughs> Owen. 
posing. Well, the doctor says that all heart attacks are serious, but the prognosis is good. He's in intensive care? Yes, uh -huh. And uh, I called Keith in Canada, and he's flying in. But Owen, what will they do to him? You know, it's been four years, and, and he's a deserter. Well, to tell you the truth, Sylvia, the military posture on draft evaders and deserters keeps shifting, and I'm just not up on the latest. Well, you know, I don't sympathize with anything he's done. I know that. But uh, if he happens to need an attorney... If Keith wants me, I'll represent him. Oh, thank you. Has, uh, has Dad been working too hard? You know your father always works hard. But I don't think that's the cause of his attack. He doesn't get enough exercise. Never did. What exactly will I be charged with, Mr. Marshall? Well, if somebody reports you for the violation of Article 86, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That's AWOL. Yeah. And that would be a special court martial, which is less serious than a general court martial. Last week, I read in the paper about a deserter who was court martialed, and he's in jail now. Oh, I know the case you mean, but that young man committed a crime while he was in the service. Now, a criminal act combined with desertion means that the deserter would be up on two counts, and he would probably face a sentence in a federal penitentiary. Well, thank heaven we don't have to worry about a thing like that. That's all Earl needs. That would just kill him. supposed to ask her, how are you feeling? Well, if I did, you'd just say great now, wouldn't you? Canada sure must agree with you. You look good. I sit down. Well, I, um, I can't, uh, doctor, stethoscope out there says I've only got two minutes. Staying with mother? Sure. No, oh, I guess I could have stayed with Julius. He always felt guilty about uh, that football injury keeping him out. Don't blame your mother if she seems distant. She loves you as much as ever. Ah. I quit throwing bricks at people who disagreed with me a long time ago. I'm afraid your mother thought life was as equitable and sugar-coated as a Sunday school parable. Then she got married and you proved she was right. <laughs> Save the buttering up for her. Remember this, Keith. Coping with ideas that, that contradict every value you've ever been taught isn't easy. You did it. Like I said, it isn't easy. Keith, now that you're home, you know what it could mean. I'm back, Dad. yesterday. Mama, I, I don't mean to be putting you down. It's just that you don't have to sneak it when I'm not looking. Well, listen to yourself. 
The great moralist. I suppose now you're going to stand in judgment on my drinking. Well, for your information, I started drinking long before your father had his attack. Oh, Mom, this is pointless. You'd already served most of your tour before you were wounded. You only had three months. Three months. Three months to kill. Keith, where is your patriotism? Well, I'm sure Robbie had it. My sister's only son died for his country. But you... Ran? Mom, would you have been happier had I died? Oh, Keith. Oh. Keith, help me to understand why you deserted. I promised Dad I'd fix the back door. Oh, no. Now, now don't go. No, no. I, I promise you that I won't get upset anymore. Oh, why don't we, um, why don't we just come on over here and have a little small talk? Now, uh, how's Vancouver? It's not Vancouver, Mom. It's Victoria. Oh, Victoria. Yeah. All right. I, um... I work in a greenhouse there. Oh, you're in a greenhouse? I'm going to be a Canadian citizen in two years, Mom. Keith, you're an American citizen. Well, I know people who would give their right arm to have an American citizenship. I know, Mom. I used to think the same thing, but it's not really true. Yes? Evening. I'm Sergeant Brady, Santa Barbara Police. Are you Keith Alvin Ryder? Yes. I have a warrant for your arrest, Mr. Ryder. Well, I'm Mrs. Ryder. I'm, I'm his mother. It's a military matter, ma'am. We have to turn him directly over to the military authorities. Mom, now listen. Tell Dad that I saw this coming, that I went back to Canada. Now, the longer you keep him in the dark, the less strain it's going to be on him, okay? Okay? Okay. Sure you won't have some. Thank you, Colonel Long. You'll hear a lot of exaggerated numbers, Mr. Marshall, but at the moment we have something over 30,000 deserters, still at large. Oh, here we go. Thank you, sir. with his performance while he was in now. Just shell fragments in the arm, while he was on patrol, hospitalized. The wound got infected, and he was transferred to Tripler General Hospital, Honolulu. And he deserted from there? Yes. Oh, here's the information you were looking for. His platoon leader in Vietnam was Lieutenant Loring Brown. He plays good tennis. Oh, he's Major Loring Brown. Uh, he's based here, but he's on leave right now. He lives just a couple hundred miles south of you, Oceanside. I can have the sergeant dig up the address for you. I'm indebted to you, Colonel. Uh, would you like to see your client now? I'd like to take him back with me. Yes, I'm sure you would. But I need a very good reason. Well, my client left his refuge in Canada because his father, a Korean veteran, incidentally, was hospitalized with a heart attack. Mr. Ryder is still there. And all this could make him an innocent victim. That's why I'm asking. You're dumping his father's life right in my lap. I'm asking, is it worth a hard-nosed stand involving one of several thousand deserters to risk the life of a man who honorably served his country? Mr. Marshall, this is just the kind of situation a kid should think about before he ups and deserts. He was very young, Colonel. And we can't change what he did. You know the father? He's a fine man. Of course, we all know the real issue here is amnesty. It's the hottest word in the country today. You make real sure he gets back here, sir. Oh, 
one thing more, Colonel. I was led to believe that there wasn't this much pressure on deserters. Oh, I assumed you knew. The client assaulted a non-com while he was in the hospital. Very nearly killed him. This will be a general court, Marshal. Major Loring Brown. That's right. That means you must be Mr. Warwick. That's right. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You know, that's the first time I realized Oceanside even had a taxi cab. <laughs> I hope you don't mind talking while I finish the car. Not at all. Give me a rag, I'll give you a hand. No, that wouldn't be any way to treat a guest. So I'll just consider you a friend. You take that in. Sylvia, I don't want Keith to run again. Well, he won't. I'm, I'm almost sure he won't. I'd be more certain of that if I knew that he had your support as well as his father's. Oh. oh. You know, I'm the world's worst hostess. It is that time of day. What can I fix for you, Owen? He'll need your support, Sylvia. Get it. Oh, I did some ice. Sylvia. Oh, I am what I am. Don't you think I want to understand? Don't you think I, I want to forgive him? It begins with understanding. But I've tried. I, I really have tried. And then, well, then I think about my own family. I have brothers and cousins, nephews, and every last one of them have served their country. Maybe events have been a little too accommodating. They provided your family with a war for every generation with a few extra thrown in. Does a man have the right to refuse the call of his country? Keith is outside. Oh. The base commander thought that because of Earl's condition. Well, well you can't keep him waiting. I, but, but it is his home. Sure, I got steamed when some guy skipped. Then I got to thinking, if a guy wanted out that bad, he's not going to be much good to me or to the others. Fact is, he could jeopardize us. You were a figure, Keith, for a dessert? Well, I was never too surprised when someone took off. Now, Ryder, he was always kind of a loner, you know? He used to read a lot. Come to think of it, he, he wrote some, too. Well, stories, poems, things like that? Oh, uh, he never showed me any of it. Only thing I ever saw was the letters he helped me with. I had this uh, need, you might call it, to write to the families of the fellows we lost. I never had what you call a way with words, but that kid sure did. You know, Major, if you can believe the polls, most people in this country think that deserters and draft evaders should be put in prison, or worse. Look, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool patriot myself, and if I thought that uh, vengeance against guys like Keith Ryder would help, I'd say, okay, where do I sign? I don't really think it would even help discourage others from doing the same thing. That's not a very popular view with the military, is it? Look, Ted, the stuff that makes for deserters is built in long before the uniform goes on. You take a plate of mashed potatoes, ain't no way that's ever going to pass for French fries. Hey, pretty good job. Come on, this calls for a couple of beers. I'll put this away. Good morning, Mr. Marshall. Oh, hi, hi. I didn't get around to returning your phone call yesterday. Well, I just wanted to set up a time when we could get together and talk. Fine, whenever. Uh, Marshal, I'll probably be throwing you a few curves. <laughs> um, Keith, just one thing now. Most students were opposed to the war. A lot of them were demonstrating, but you enlisted. Why? Probably the same reason why I deserted. At the time, I thought it was the right thing to do. How about Monday at 2? Fine, I'll be there. Uh, Mr. Marshall, are you figuring on some fancy legal maneuvering to have my charge reduced? Oh, standard procedure in a desertion case. Well, not this time around. You see, the way I look at it, uh, when I signed up, I really didn't know what was cooking in Nam. I was dazzled by all the, all the excitement, the adventure. I, 
I was all caught up in words like commitment, duty, hero. <laughs> Mr. Marshall, if I let this same kind of razzle-dazzle stuff reduce my charge, then I'd be a hypocrite and I'd never get my head on straight. If you still want to represent me, then you'll have to find something new. That's the standard AWOL number, just uh, isn't for me. See, Mr. Marshall, I'm a deserter. And uh, I don't want to be tried for anything less. I smashed it. Your father's coming home tomorrow. And it's 11 o'clock and I was going to have a drink. Keith, I want everything to be right when he comes home. I get a broom, sweep off the glass. Uh, Mr. Marshall doesn't seem to think I'm a very good listener. For you, he meant. It's not your fault, Mom. You just had certain things drilled into you, and no one ever shook them loose. Well, what sort of things? Rules. Lines drawn between right and wrong. Trust. Tradition. Obedience. Is that so bad? They're words. Without eyes. They can't see. What do you mean? Like, trust. I mean, let's say you trust a doctor, but you don't get better. And you stick with him and you might die. That's, that's trust that, that doesn't see. It's blind trust. Me, I'd, I'd check another doctor. He might have information the first one didn't have. And, um, tradition? Uh, I don't know, Mom, but tradition is... Oftentimes it's just uh, another crutch for us to lean on. It's a dangerous one, too. Because so often we, we rely on tradition when, when we know in our gut that it's, it's all wrong. Keith? You're different. I know. And a disappointment, too. I'm sorry. Keith. Why? <laughs> you begin to sound like a shrink, Mom. <laughs> you know, uh, Mr. Marshall wants me to see one before the trial starts. He says it'll help in court. Uh, it'll be good. It'll be good to talk, talk about all this with someone else. Keith? Why? Well, I began um, on patrol. I had to bayonet a VC in the neck. I couldn't have been over 16. I threw up. When you went in, you thought the war was right? I was 18 years old, Mom. War to me was something that John Wayne did, or something I saw on, on TV. You know, it's one thing to make speeches or to listen to them about great causes and, and, and glory and honor, and, but it's another thing to see 
the women and the kids, and they're scared to death. And they're crying, and they're mourning their, their, their fathers and their husbands that you killed. You know, I, I'm being tried for the wrong reasons. I should be charged for murder. Then you and Private Ryder were in the same company and on more than one patrol together. Is that correct, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. We patrolled together just over two months. And did he ever say anything to you that might suggest his intentions to desert? Well, sir, I live right on the Canadian border. I spend a lot of time up there. Private Ryder kept asking me what it would be like living in Canada. Well, I'd say that most of the time at the hospital, he was sullen and moody. I mean, most guys like to kid around with the nurses, but Private Ryder never did. Did you ever discuss this moodiness with the defendant, Miss Coulter? Yes, several times. He said he felt guilty being a part of the war. He said that if he was ever sent back, that he might want to kill himself. Kill himself? I see. Uh, would you say this same hostile streak surfaced when he attacked Sergeant Lagarde? No objection, Your Honor. Trial counsel is twisting the witness's words. Sustained. I have no more questions of this witness, Your Honor. Yes, sir. I'd seen Sergeant Lagarde around the hospital. And did you talk with him? Several times. On one of those occasions, you began a fight with him. Yes, sir. Striking this non-commissioned officer, first with your fist, and subsequently with a metal chair. Yes, sir. Well, following this incident, were you not advised you'd be subject to a court-martial? Yes, sir. Is it a fact that threatened with disciplinary action, you were then newly motivated to carry out a plan that had been festering in your mind for some time? Yes, sir. Private Ryder, did that plan involve desertion? Yes, sir. Mr. Marshall, the trial counsel has practically won an admission of guilt from your client on both counts. Now, I'm assuming that uh, your defense will be able to handle this line of questioning. I appreciate the concern, Your Honor, and I hope that Your Honor's assumption is correct. Private Ryder, at approximately 7.30 on the night of February 13th in 1970, at that time unknown to anyone, you walked out of Tripler General Hospital in Honolulu. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What was your destination? Honolulu International Airport. And beyond that? Vancouver, Canada. Miss Coulter, was Sergeant Anton Lagarde a patient at the time defendant attacked him? No, he was assigned to the hospital. Then he wasn't physically impaired or handicapped? No, he wasn't. And what about Private Ryder's condition? Well, he had his... Right arm in a cast and in a sling. Hardly an even match. Now, nurses are trained to be discreet, but I wonder if there's anything about Sergeant Lagarde that you feel might be relevant to this trial. Did he, for instance, have a sideline to his duties as a member of the armed forces? Uh, well, he, uh, he arranged when the men were discharged, they usually had some leave time in Honolulu, and he used to fix them up with girls. He tried to solicit me. Keith began his psychotherapy with me two months ago today. We've had 25 sessions. Now, Dr. Metz, knowing that this court-martial was imminent, were you able to reach some pertinent conclusions about Keith? Let me tell you something. We're gathered here 
to try to find out why Keith Ryder deserted the colors, right? It was guilt. Tried and true guilt. What about? The violation of his moral standards. Now, that's not so fancy as it sounds. Understand, we are all regulated morally, socially, ethically. But no two of us is regulated the same. And would you say that Keith was morally regulated about average? Beyond average and then some. That's what drew him into the war to begin with. He enlisted in a cause, not in an army. He signed on to save the world from communism, not to kill anybody. And I'll tell you just what happened. He got into combat, and his psyche got battered, almost mortally wounded. His psyche? You mean himself, his ideals? And that's how the guilt begins. These idealists, these moralists, like Keith, they never say to themselves, look, fella, to let that farmer vote, you have just got to kill this fisherman. They don't say that. But put him in that predicament and you've got trouble. Keith Ryder volunteered to take part in the slaughter that he detested. That's gilding the guilt. That's pulling the pin on the grenade and swallowing it whole. It's a very self-destructive situation. Now, am I understanding you correctly? The defendant was not morally regulated to involve himself even remotely in the calculated killing that is part of warfare. As far as Keith Ryder is concerned, there was only one thing could save him from being smothered in his own guilt. What was that, Doctor? His desertion. Dr. Madsen, uh, to your knowledge, did Private Ryder ever take his problems to a chaplain? No, he did not. And yet spiritual guidance was available to him. I'm sure it was. Nor did he consult with his commanding officer. Nor did he request transfer from combat duty. Nor did he discuss his feelings with any of the psychiatrists at Tripler General Hospital. In brief, Dr. Metz, insofar as you know, Private Ryder did not exercise any of the options available to him within the law or the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Now, isn't that true? That's quite true. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well, he wasn't what you call gung-ho, but he wasn't any tail end Charlie either. Would you say that he performed on a par with the other men in your platoon? Yes, sir. Every time out. Except maybe once. Tell us about that time. We were on uh, S&D, Search and Destroy. There's a small village up ahead. Our information was that about 20 VC were hiding there. Our orders were to... Uh, advance and shoot anything that moved. You said a village. Now, weren't there children and women involved? We were told they'd been evacuated. So we, uh, we started to move in just before sunup. One of the men saw something move and fired. That got everybody jumpy, and in a few seconds we were ripping bullets into every shack in sight. Was the return fire? Yes, sir, but not very heavy. It stopped in about a minute. I gave the order to cease fire. We moved in, we started checking the shacks. They were dead. One of my men noticed that uh, there was a woman in uniform. We took a closer look. Twelve of the VC were women. Of the uh, 17 men, they were more like boys. 16, 15, maybe younger. We'd killed them all. We had to rendezvous with another company, so I gave the order to march out. Private Ryder didn't seem to hear me. Took out a shovel and he started digging the grave. That kind of got to us, so we all started digging. Now, Keith, you have freely admitted your assault on Sergeant Anton Lagarde. Will you tell the court why? I 
I saw a lot of him uh, before I figured out he was peddling girls. Lagarde was older than the rest of us in the ward. So I decided that he would be the best one to rap to. Uh, about deserting, I mean. And so you confided in him? Yes, sir. Then, the night of the fight, he, uh, he came to me with his roll. Looked like about $1,000 or more. He was stuck and uh, couldn't deliver it. He knew I was getting, uh, getting around pretty well, so he wanted me to run his errand for him. Did you know what the money represented? Sure. He was into prostitution, money for his civilian partner. So you refused to convey the money? Yes, sir. Then he threatened me. Said he'd spill the whole thing about my feelings on desertion. He uh, even said he'd color it, make it sound like I was trying to talk everybody else into deserting. He blew my mind. I hit him. Did Dr. Metz think that was uncharacteristic? No. No. Dr. Metz said that I just happened to be around for the wrong war. Your Honor, I submit a transcript which shows that Sergeant Anton Lagarde of Morrissey Falls, Louisiana, was himself court-martialed on grounds that support my client's testimony. Lagarde is now in the U.S. Penitentiary on McNeil Island in the state of Washington. I ask that this transcript be admitted in evidence as Defense Exhibit B. How free is the mind of a free man when his country goes to war? In the past, it has generally been conceded that the freedom to think for himself is lost when a man becomes a soldier. But then there came a time of unspeakable terror unthinkable atrocities. The battlefield was anywhere a bullet could reach, a bomb could fall. Artillery made no distinction between combatant and infantry. The front line was anybody's backyard. And after U.S. military might had finally brought an end to the slaughter, a bloody planet looked at the enemy soldier and said, How dare you consider yourselves humans, created in God's image, when we see what you have done? And the soldier said, We were ordered to do it. We did it for our country. It was a confusing and profound issue. Special trials were held at Nuremberg. And after it was all over, there were lengthy documents with simple observations. They said that the individual soldier had to exercise his own conscience, had to determine in his own mind whether the orders given him were legal or in violation of moral military conduct. We recognized conscience and its role in warfare. We recognized it again when the laws of our land said that it was acceptable for certain men to be conscientious objectors. I recognized it when I got to know my client well. I have already submitted his service record as evidence in extenuation and mitigation. He did the very best he could for eight months in Vietnam. Can we persecute him for the three months he listened to his conscience? Uh, this court will come to order. All the parties present at the trial and the court closed are now present. Private Keith Ryder. 
Now, it is my duty as president of this court to inform you that the court in closed session and upon secret ballot, two-thirds of the members of the court present at the time the vote was taken finds you of specification one and the charge of violation of Article 91, assaulting a non-commissioned officer, not guilty. Of specification two and the charge of violation of Article 85, desertion, not guilty. But guilty of a violation of Article 86, absent without leave. Do you uh, wish to have sentence rendered at this time? Yes, we do, Your Honor. Private Keith Ryder, it is my duty as president of this court to inform you that the court in closed session and upon secret written ballot, all of the members present at the time the vote was taken concurring, sentences you to perform hard labor for a period of 60 days. However, because of the facts in extenuation and mitigation, that sentence will be suspended. Gentlemen, this court thanks you for your patience and consideration throughout the trial and states that this court is in adjournment. Not to put on one ounce. If it does, you can sue my cardiologist. It's his diet. <laughs> if that doesn't work, I'm a good lawyer. <laughs> I know a couple myself. This brunch might go down better, Owen, if you told him the good news. Keith is being processed for general discharge under honorable conditions. That is wonderful news. I can't tell you how happy I am, Keith. Oh, darling. <laughs> Come on, let's see. All right. Oh, and I am so grateful. Is he still going back to Canada? <laughs> no, he's going to stay here. And he's going back to school. You must be very happy. You've been through a lot with both... Earl and Keith. I don't think I could be any happier. Well, then hang on. Because I've also learned that he's entitled to all his veterans' benefits, including education. I didn't know that. I'm sure Keith doesn't know it. Oh, isn't it, isn't it wonderful how much we've learned? Thank you, Owen. Mr. T here. Sometimes good TV is easy as ABC. A for A team, B for B.A. Baracus, and C for see us go to work next right here in TV land.